Joining us now with more on the markets and the uncertainty, Bilal Hafiz, Macro Hive CEO and founder. Christina Kino, uh, who leads Bloomberg's M Live coverage for Europe, also joining us. Um, Bilal, let me start with you. We seem to have this retrospective review of what the market really wanted. It now seems that the market wanted divided governments all along. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody in the market, analysts uh, like myself, are, are very good at coming up with ex post rationalizations of uh, what it was good for, for markets. Um, luckily, you can go back to see what people were actually saying before. Um, you know, my, my own personal stance was to do nothing around the election because it would be chaotic no matter what. And, you know, I think there's no edge that one can really have in trading around elections better to wait for the dust to settle. But certainly, there is a lot of this uh, expert rationalization around why stocks are so, so high. So is it all the election, or is it also the fact that we had sold off tech into that? There's still the virus going around, so there's still work from home, virus cases moving higher in the U.S. Uh, as well as Europe. Well, I just want to get your take on sort of how, how much of which is leading the NASDAQ. No, they're, they're a very good point. I mean, we, we can't forget that there was a big drop last week. Stocks really started to rally a few days before the election when people were still expecting um, a, um, a blue sweep, we, we have to remember. Um, and of course, you know, when COVID, when there have been COVID fears, tech has tended to outperform, you know, uh, non-tech uh, stocks uh, as well. The one thing I would say in terms of the gridlock is that there were concerns around tech regulation if there was going to be a Democrat clean sweep. And so now with a Senate unlikely to flip to Democrat, then that's off the table. So that's a, a great environment for for tech stocks. And on top of that, yields have fallen as well, which again is another factor that's good for, for tech stocks uh, as well. So, so I think it's a confluence of all of those forces. Stocks were already down a lot. We've got these COVID concerns. And then on top of that, there's no chance of tech regulation. Yeah, Bilal, as Christine pointed out, talking about yields, and I hate to ask a pedestrian question, but literally how low can yields go here? I mean, these are very whippy moves that we've seen over the last 12 hours. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, to some extent, it depends also what the Fed says uh, tomorrow, if they do open a door to further stimulus. If we do, uh, and on top of that, we have to get some sense of whoever does uh, win the presidency, what happens during the lame duck session uh, into the year end, whether the, uh, Congress is able to pass some kind of mini stimulus or not. Is it $500 billion? Is it one and a half trillion or not? And so, you know, depending on these parameters, you know, the Fed could really step up. And then, then that could see bond yields, say 10-year bond yields, moving down, back down towards, you know, say at least a 60.6% mark uh, at the very least. Bilal, let me come back to you. The, the virus narrative is still there and the, the cases are ticking up in the United States. Do you think there is a, a, an argument that says that if we do get a President Biden, regardless of what happens in the Senate, that Biden is going to take a tougher line, similar to the one we're seeing here in Europe, in, in order to, to deal with that virus? Um, there have been accusations levelled at President Trump that he hasn't do it, done enough. Do you think President Biden would do more? And is that a market event? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, I mean, one thing just for context one has to remember is if you do look at, say, deaths uh, per capita, the U.S. is in the same ballpark as the U.K., Spain and France. So although, you know, lots of people like to point to Trump as, as or the U.S. as being an outlier, it's it's really kind of in the same ballpark at some, as some of the European countries, Belgium as well. Um, but that said, I, you know, I do think that President Biden would probably have a more a clearer and consistent message um, around how to deal with COVID. And he would more, more ably uh, come up with uh, protocols and consistent uh, measures across all the different states. So that, at the margin, should you know, stop the, the spread of, of the virus, I would imagine. Um, the UK going into lockdown midnight tonight. Uh, Bilal, we're going to get a Bank of England rate decision tomorrow and more from the Chancellor. Let's focus on the last two factors there. What do you think the Bank of England needs to do tomorrow to deal with and counterweight what we're seeing as a result of this additional lockdown? Well, I think that the key thing is um, that the Bank of England, England will likely increase its QE program by £100 billion to just over £800 billion in total. And one reason, obviously, will be to try to you know, lower interest rates. But the other is that the lockdown will likely lead to a higher 
a budget deficit from, from the UK. And so the Bank of England almost mechanically will need to absorb that. Otherwise, bond yields could start to start to rise. So I think that will be the, the main thing they'll do tomorrow. They'll probably also revise down some of their economic uh, projections as well. They were expecting a stronger Q3 than it actually turned out. Q4, in my view, will probably turn out to be negative. So we get this W-shaped uh, you know, path. Consensus at the moment is still looking for a positive Q4, although much lower than Q3. Uh, Bilal, is this going to be the MMT experiment now? Uh, we've been talking about that for a while. Is this when we're really going to see it when we go into these second rounds of lockdowns? Well, I think uh, it, it obviously depends on their language around how they describe this all. But in practice, this is as close as, as you can get to MMT without calling it MMT, you know, where you start to increase your QE programs to match an increase in fiscal deficit numbers. Um, and this is happening, uh, you know, almost everywhere around the world. And to some extent, you could say the earlier QE programs were like that as well. Um, that, you know, the key thing, you know, one needs to work out is will they ever exit? Will they ever unwind their stock of bond holdings? And at this stage, it's, it's hard to see them doing that, you know, for the next four or five years. So in that sense, we could effectively be in an MMT environment. Bil Bilal... The, the bank's been asked that question a lot recently, and the governor always bats it away. I'm going to talk to the governor tomorrow morning. Is, is the purpose of QE now, though, basically just to keep the markets calm so the government can issue? Is that a better way of looking at it? And if so, if QE is start, starting to lose its effect, do we then move to a yield curve control, which would be an almost a more overt way of making that happen? No, that's a very good point. I mean, I think that the language central bankers have been using is they've been urging, uh, you know, finance ministers and, and, you know, the prime ministers or presidents of their countries to you know, engage in fiscal policy. The IMF, almost every, you know, credible institution is talking about fiscal policy, uh, you know, because of, as you rightly point out, monetary policy is, is less effective. Um, so there is obviously a strong case for fiscal. The central bank does want to accommodate that and make it easier for that to happen. Um, in terms of you know, the next steps for central banks, as you point out, you know, QE is one, which they're already engaging in. Yield curve control is, is the next step within this. The Bank of Japan has done this for a number of years. You have someone like the RBA, uh, Reserve Bank of Australia, who's already engaging in that. So that would probably be one of the, the next steps. You know, I do think there is an alternative to all of this, which is to follow the path of China, where the PBOC hasn't really done as much QE or rate cuts over the course of this year. Instead, they've been very smart about giving credit to different uh, parts of the economy. So recently, they did a digital currency program where mm -hmm. they gave digital currency to all the residents of a certain province. But that digital currency could only be used to buy things in certain shops. And so it was a very targeted way of introducing uh, credit to, to the economy. So that could be the curveball in all of this, whether other countries around the world start to copy what China is doing with digital currency. Uh, that and also what they're doing with the virus. Uh, Asia really shutting it down in a way that we didn't see uh, in the West. So do the relative valuation play, right? You have Europe, you have uh, China, and then you have the U.S., which is going to have the best and most firepower to fight the virus, to fight uh, lackluster growth, and then how the dollar kind of wraps into all that. No, that's all kind of a good point. I would say overall, it's it's very evident that North Asia, I think, is 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 kind of a standout here because they they dealt with the virus very well. They uh, well, particularly China has a lot of sort of firepower and know and they know how to uh, you know run kind of a, a very sort of state directed economy, whereas the Western countries are just learning how to do all of that. So I think they are the leaders of the pack here. That said, they still depend on global demand. You know, they still depend on U.S. growth and, and so on. So there is that caveat. After that, I would say Europe actually probably stands out a bit more than the U.S. insofar as on the fiscal policy side. I think Europe has more, ironically, has more flexibility on that side, especially Germany, who have been much more generous on their fiscal programs than they have ever been. So, so Europe could... Uh, could then be the most interesting one. Then the U.S. would lag somewhat in, within all of this. So from a currency perspective, I think for me, what falls out from this is generally a weak dollar environment. But, you know, I think at the moment, I'd probably play that more against the Asian currency. So I'd expect the renminbi to do well against the dollar and the Japanese yen. The euro, obviously, today it's doing well. But I think the euro is a bit more trickier because Europe's at the, sort of at the center of the second wave right now. Um, you know, core inflation is very low, and the ECB has talked about stepping up its its, its uh, PEP 
program uh, towards the end of this year, so that might uh, limit Euro gains. But Bilal, just looking more broadly, at, particularly at transatlantic relations, there was this expectation that if we got a blue wave, that would benefit Europe, both from a political point of view and from a financial market point of view. European equities were expected to rally as the value trade really kicked in. That's the exact opposite of what we're seeing today. Do you think there's any juice left in that narrative? Uh, if we do get divided government in the States, does Europe rally? I, it, it certainly doesn't seem that it's going to rally in the same way as the US does, certainly with that tech narrative that's developing with the Nasdaq up sharply. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the main thing with a divided government is if Biden's in power, then presumably that would mean that there'll be improved multilateral relations between the US and Europe, which at the margin... Uh, you know, could be positive for European stocks. Um, aside from that, you know, I think there is a general beta of European stocks to US stocks. If US, even if US tech stocks are doing well, then Europe should also so should also do well. But I think you know, outside of that, I think really it's the COVID uh, scenarios that are much more important for European stocks than whether the US has a divided government or not. Bilal, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you. Really love the insight, Bilal Aviz of Macro Hive. Thanks a lot. This is Bloomberg.